Hi everyone. It's quite a beautiful building. Um, I'll start by saying I'm not going to talk about Jenny I. <laughs> um, what I realized if you were a couple of, you know, depending on how long you've been in this game for, it was social graphs. And then it was buy now, pay later. NFTs, crypto, W3, the latest one, du jour. there was ML at one point, there was the debate, is AI ML, is ML AI? And then, of course, now this Gen AI. And what I realize is actually what we should focus on, and one of the things that I've seen, having been fortunate to kind of go through all of those things, both as an engineer, and then as a designer, and now as a product manager, as well in operations, is that we actually need to create a culture of building. And this is going to feel like a boot camp. I'm basically going to try to compress seven years of experience into 30 minutes, 25 and 40 seconds to be exact. So bear with me. I want to just get a pulse of the room. How many people are actually product managers? Wonderful. How many are UX? And I mean design, writing, content strategy. She's not sure. Um, OK. And how many are Eng? Wow. Hi. <laughs> okay, this gives me a sense. Um, so I really love building. I studied electrical engineering. I love building. I love, and I sometimes think we take for granted what it is to imagine something in your head, bring it to life, and then see it in the hands of people. And how magical and how humbling that is. And when, you know, I'm in a position where I've, if I was to go through, whether it's Uber or Netflix or YouTube, these are products that people are using every day. And it's such a humbling position to be in, because you actually don't know a lot of things. But what you can sort of lean into is that PMs at their core need to believe there's a mission worth waking up and fighting for, need to believe that the people around them they can learn from, and most importantly, have agency. If a PM doesn't have one of these three things, you will end up with this dissatisfaction. And so having been through these three companies, what I started questioning was, what does it mean to build? So I'll go a little bit in. First of all, this is going to sound like a philosophy lesson. It starts with you. I'll talk about my experience. I you know, was an engineer, then I was a designer, and I decided I was going to go do an MBA, because that's what, I guess, PMs were supposed to do. Um, I would join big tech, and then I'd work at a place like Google. I never got that MBA. Saved my 100,000, whatever it is. Joined big tech, and I work at Google. And it was this sort of serendipitous journey, but at its core, there was a problem, and that's what led me into product. I was the general manager for West Africa. People couldn't pay because they didn't have credit cards. They wanted to use the product. It was like a 90% drop-off rate. And I was like, we need to launch cash. Um, the team that actually built a lot of that product is here in Amsterdam. Folks don't realize. A lot of when you open up all these Uber apps, it's actually from the team that sits here. And I started thinking of this maybe this is actually an opportunity to move into big tech and work in product management. But I was like, what is product management? How is it different from product owner, project manager, program manager? And that started this lifelong quest to understand and unpack this craft. And it's still an ongoing lifelong quest because the number one thing that you will learn in product management is humility. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And so one of the things that I started to realize is as I crack product management, I need to actually understand and be super aware of who I am in the Avengers team. Who's watched Avengers? If you, the rest of you, go watch it. It's amazing. It's all these superheroes doing amazing stuff. But you have like the Hulk, this green guy that bashes through walls. And you have like, you know, Iron Man, this rich guy with lots of gizmos and so on and so forth. And they don't try to do the same things. And oftentimes, people come to me and say, oh, I have this weakness, I need to fix it. And I'm like, well, let's start with your superpowers. Do you even know what they are? Or they'll tell me there's a superpower. My superpower is communication. I'm like, you couldn't string together your life story just now. And you're telling me your life story, your superpower is communication. So this super awareness of what your superpowers are and what your kryptonites are, Superman, kryptonite. And by knowing those kryptonites, it's helped me navigate. They're just situations that I should not put myself in and their product situations that I might need help, and I know who to go look for, and I have a mind map of the people with different superpowers and organization that I can lean on for different things. The next is this notion of curiosity. 
and it's this ability to continue to learn. One of the biggest things I've learned, especially during my time at Uber, and that's carried me all through my career, is I'm really good at learning. And it's, it's really simple, it's just, it starts with the humility, but then it goes into being able to figure out what you don't know and being able to focus your attention and close that gap. And that curiosity as a PM, it's dogfooding. The amount of PMs who've never gone through the onboarding of their product that is live, the amount of PMs who do not test the actual thing that's built, they want the UX person to call out the pixels that are different, and so on and so forth. It's this curiosity to understand what you don't know and to continue to build context. And then the final one is courage. But I'll say something on the side of courage. Courage, really, creativity at the core of creativity is vulnerability. And this ability to know that you're going to put something in the world. What do we do when we write hypotheses and jobs to be done? We have no idea if it's going to work when it, go in the real li and it goes into the real life. We're trying to get some courage and conviction this is the right thing to do. But I, I will say something on the side, which is, once you've understand, understood all of that, at the core, it's actually PMing your life and not having a situation where you are reacting. It, like I said, it could be Gen AI, it could be some leader that spoke to one customer and suddenly decides this is the thing that needs to be done on the roadmap. You're laughing because you know it's happened. Um, and it's this ability to, you know, PM your life so that you are not reacting. And I'm going to say something that sounds weird standing on a PM uh, stage. I was talking to Lenny, um, who has Lenny's podcast, and I said, we need to do something on just like well-being because the amount of PMs who are speed reading emails, badly writing, inundated by e like multiple emails, emails again, meetings, et cetera, not realizing actually what are your P0s, what are your P1s, what are your P2s, do you really need to be in that meeting, really? And so I've taken this and I have PM my life, my P0 sleep, if I do not get seven, eight hours in a day, you get the worst version of AB, statistically, under six hours, you're basically a drunken person, which could be good for creativity, but these are sort of the things that I have decided as I go through this, this craft, which will have things knocking me sideways, it really starts with you and understanding who you are, how you want to show up, and how you create the, the curiosity and the courage. So at Uber, we had this manual. It wasn't really a manual. We used to call them playbooks. That sounds more fun. And it was called the Build This Playbook. And it was a living document written by some of the top product leaders at Uber. And what I loved about this document was it, it literally answered everything. How to communicate, how to launch, why you should do this to GTM, when you should go to multiple markets versus a single market, what metrics to look for. I remember reading this book and just like, this uh, Google Doc book, whatever, um, and just ingesting it. And over my career, what I've started to do is basically distill elements of that playbook. I kept the name, because great art, art is steel, and create my own builder's playbook that is simple and it's something I can take with me. And that's really the rest of this talk. It's the six tenets. It's a lot, I warn you, um, that basically, in my mind, create this notion or this environment that allows you build. The first is... People talk a lot about what is product management. Everybody probably has heard about the three-legged stool. No? Oh, okay, someone's nodding. Wow, maybe that's the talk I should have gave. Um, the three-legged stool is this idea that product management is business impact, right? Uh, customer experience and technology, or the idea model, usability, feasibility, viability. That's the three-legged stool. That's PME, right? Um, it is not managing a list of things in Jira. That's, product, that's something else, and that's not product management. I'm not going to talk about that today. We don't have time. Um, so people talk about this three-legged stool, and I actually think about product, and I'm glad we had the one engineer, yay, and you know, the other UX folks in the room, but this notion of like product is product, the product manager, and maybe it's contrarian, but I don't think that it is. Product actually, when you think about those three functions, if you put them together and you look at that diagram, it looks like a Mickey Mouse. And there is a saying in English, you don't want to run a Mickey Mouse shop, which is basically like a joke, right? So we don't want to run a Mickey Mouse shop. What you want instead is what I call the mandala. Um, if you are into yoga or you meditate, um, I promise, I'm going to stop talking about philosophy for a second, but the mandala is this thing that is almost geometri geometrically balanced, that actually you use when you're meditating as a focal point. 
What are we doing as product managers? Clarity, where we're going. And so I think of this mandala, and it's how I think about the functions coming together. It's UX, it's product, managers, and eng. And that combined group creates product. So we have a, I have a statement in my, with my team, and I say, we are product. So when you come into a meeting, there is no PM said this, or Eng said that, or tech said that, or UX said that. It's this combined group. You can add one more circle if you want to throw in data science, still get a mandala, right? And a mandala is this magical thing. So I wouldn't be the PM I am today without the partners that I've gotten to work with. Some of the best designers, um, uh, some of the best engineers, one that a lot of people know called the pragmatic engineer. We sort of talk about each other on Twitter all the time, like gushing over each other. Um, and it's because there was this push and this challenge co constantly. So I'm going to give you some practical sort of advice here. You want about 60 to 70% of what you do as a group to be quite overlapped. That sounds like a, a lot. And it, you, it might sound like, oh my god, I have to pull them into every meeting. But I'll tell you how that, what that looks like. So first, at the very core, you know who you are. Who are these people? If I asked you what was the birthday of your UX partner, or your engineering partner, or your data science partner, you can't even tell me their astrology sign. But if you could tell me their birthday, you couldn't tell me their birthday, that, for me, is already an epic fail. It is the day this person showed up in the world. It is the most important day to them and the people around them. And you don't know that. And so I start with really, who is this person? What are their values? What are they optimizing for? What are their fears? When they show up into work, what are they bringing with them? Because we come in. I know people say, you know, bring your whole self to work. But really, people bring their whole selves to work. If I had a crazy morning, my, one of my partners who has kids, if they're like going berserk, I'm just not going to have the same kind of conversation with her on that day, and so on and so forth. So who are these people? And make the time to understand the people, because you will have the foundation of trust, and nothing else, especially in a world that's constantly changing, beats that. The second tactical thing is what I call the operating cadence. It's literally a doc. For my team, it's like go, we have short links at Google, go slash studio. OPEX, right? But not the other OPEX. Operating, um, um, op cadence, sorry, not OPEX. Um, and the op operating cadence basically is trying to capture the rhythm and the flow of the organization. Our monthly newsletters go out exactly the first Thursday of every month. Our monthly all hands happens the first Wednesday of every month. In the week, we do a push, converge, pull, push. So Mondays, Tuesdays, we have one on ones. We meet our teams, we pull context. Wednesdays, we meet discuss. We discuss the top three things we are all going to work on together, 60-70%. We discuss the top three things they're going to work on that are not part of that list. Over time, it's almost like two out of three are exactly aligned. And then we go into Thursdays where we have a leads meeting, where we have all our direct reports in a room, and we have, again, a drumbeat. We'll start the meeting with any spicy topics, literally with chilies. Three chilies, super hot, two chilies, not so hot, one chili, and that's the escalation. So it becomes this forum where it's like, oh, I got this ping, I'm worried about this thing, you could just voice it. Then we go into what's launching, what launched last week. And then we finally go into um, uh, uh, open discussions topics. And that's every single week. And that's just on a weekly basis. And I mentioned the monthly basis. Then we have the quarterly, where we go do a retro, what's working, what's not working. And we'll have a very open, raw conversation with the triad. People will bring in personal things. I've brought in personal things. People will talk about, you know, we'll give feedback to each other. But we can all rant. And eventually, as PMs, we have to focus. So we'll basically say, I, I basically drive a conversation around what do we want to put our energy behind fixing? It could be last month, for example, when we did our retro. We talked about this notion of making sure our partner teams understood the investments we were making into the stack. And that was one thing we said we we're going to focus on. And we said, we'll do a roadshow. And we did the roadshow. So you can tactically say, OK, there are three things. We got it all out, laid it out on the table. But these are the things that we're going into. And then every year around June, we just had it, um, we basically have an annual sprint. And we follow the double diamond. I'm not going to Google it. Um, where you basically go through a problem space. We converge on a set of problems. And then we go into solution space, converge in a set of solutions. And that brings out the strategic pillars for our teams going into the planning season. Google starts planning in July. I know. For 2025, I know. It's 
endless. But basically, we pass that down to the team, so there's very clear direction. And the final one is traffic lights. I actually learned this from a friend of mine who um, is a, a, a senior leader at Deliveroo, used to be at Uber, and she basically has a bot. So if you have Slack, you can do this. We have Gchat. It's a bot that goes in, it puts a traffic light, and you react with the color that you're feeling. Red is, I am super drained. Yellow is, I'm sort of, I could be better. Green is, I'm super energized. And that's every week. And I'm just giving, I'm scattershotting a bunch of things to you, but the key here is, there is a rhythm. And humans, we operate, our hearts are in a rhythm, right? We operate in rhythms. And so, those are three things. Who are these people? Understand who they are. Build your operating cadence and actually document it. It's literally a document with colors. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, what happens weekly, bi-weekly, quarterly, monthly, etc. And then finally, the traffic lights. What happens if you don't? We're in the Netherlands, we're 25 meters below sea level, in case you didn't know. Um, rowing is huge. If you go on the Amstel, there are a lot of people rowing. I used to row, I don't row anymore, but I used to row all the time. Have you ever seen a boat of eight people and one person's trying to go right, the other one's trying to go left, the other one's going to travel backwards? Basically, what starts to happen is you have the context is lost, you lose the mind meld, you just can't even think beyond when you're thinking about, let me first update you on what just happened in the PM meeting, let me just update you on what's going on in the, the tech debt, eng stack, something crashed. You're actually able to go a lot faster by going slow. We are a product. The second is zoom out and zoom in. Basically, as a PM especially, and as a product group, you want to have a very clear picture of where you are going and what it looks like when you get there. That is your vision. Zoom out. And you want to get into what does it look like to take the first step. Zoom in. And what I do when I join any org or team is I go through first a context building, because no leader has the answers. I call it the three Cs. I'll have a lot of conversations with stakeholders. I'll ask all of them the exact same five questions. Last one being, what are the top three things you think I should focus on? I'll distill that down, and I go into the next phase I call comprehension, where I'll share that out. And then finally, I'll get to conviction with a plan. So for example, when I joined Google, one of the things that kept coming up was this notion of, you know, we don't have enough PMs. And by sharing it with my manager, this is sort of the, the readout, he's like, well, here's the context on why that is, da da da, this is what's happening. I don't think it's about, you know, not having PMs. I think it's about the right skill set. And so we went into the next 90 days with a very clear action plan. If there's one thing you took away from this entire talk, it's this. Whenever you're joining any new company, it's so easy to run in and think you have the answers. You do not. You do not have context. And so by building that sort of context, you're able to go through the three Cs, conversation, comprehension, conviction, also new projects, right? You do the same thing. You distill it, and every, you can come back and say, there are five things I said I was going to do, and I did them, and I heard you, and everyone feels heard and seen. The next thing I do is one of the things that came up with Google was, you know, the YouTube uh, studio team's like, we, we don't know if we're a platform or a product. Like, we don't know if we support, we're an app, because that's every, every team that builds products for creators builds into the studio app, or if we are actually a product in itself. And so this was the zoom out. We basically went into the, a room, we had a three-day session. Um, I used the framework Insight Strategy Big Rocks. Insights Day, it's purely sharing. I have all the teams come to me with, five, with a slide that's called Five Things I Should Know. Because every team will come up with all their things, but it forces them to stack rank. So we have an org of 160 people, five things I should know. We brought in marketing, UXR, um, product specialists, the ones who actually do the go-to-market, or product ops, depending on which comp you know, what company you're in. Legal, Gap, etc. We brought them all in, five things you should know, very quick. And we use that to distill down what the top problems were by covering and going wide, as wide as possible. And then we go into the actual vision setting. And one of the most powerful tools that I keep using is what I call the Pixar storytelling model. Does anybody know what that is? So if you've watched a Pixar movie, how many people have watched a Pixar movie? There you go. So you kind of know what it is. Um, it's like once upon a time, every day, and then one day something happened, and because of that, something happened, and as a result, something happened, and the state of the world afterwards. It's a simple tool to write the world that you see. Once upon a time, we had outages every day. 
And then one day, we rolled out the new platform. I'm giving love to all the platform PMs. Um, and then because of that, we went to five lines of availability, and people got paid instantly, and so on and so forth. And so the Pixar story mo model is what I use to shape a vision, or sometimes once we have that, we'll pr I'll print out an app store uh, a sheet and actually have people sketch in that. But that's your zoom out. That then all gets distilled into what I call a product narrative, and that's your zoom in. What are the next steps we need to take to make this thing come to life? And that's where you have your strategy, what am I going to do first, and then what am I going to do after? And strategy is not picking out the things that are bad ideas. Strategy is actually leaving good ideas on the table. If you're going into a room and you have bad ideas in the room, you have the wrong people. You have good ideas and you're actually saying, wait a minute, we've got to pick. And so that's what we do with the zoo at Zoom In. It's a two to four page document. Every year I have one called Go slash Studio in 2024, Studio in 2023. And my partner teams know, even my out of office has it, want to know what we're doing? Go slash Studio Teams 2024. Um, so now you've got your zoom out vision. You've got your zoom in, your narrative, which is really what you're doing in those big rocks. And then the step that people sometimes forget is the socializing. That it actually takes almost half the time to socialize the thing you need to build as it takes to build it and bring it to life. And that is, you're going first to your team where they actually believe in this vision and can give you all the reasons why they think it's not going to work, and you will never get 100% consensus. We're going to get to that in a second. But you're also then going to your partner teams and making sure that they're bought in. And then you're going further out and going to leadership. And it took, we set up a vision, we called it Studio 2026, four-year vision. That came out in 2022. It took us a year and a half just to roll off the old roadmap, get everyone bought in, to actually land building things this year. And I'm very proud to say of the four things we were going to do, three are already underway and almost about to launch this year. So that's your zoom out and zoom in. If this doesn't happen, it's like a dream without a plan, which is a rudderless ship. Owners, not renters. How many folks are from Amsterdam or the Netherlands? Great. You know what Swap Feeds is? OK, this is not who has a Swap Feeds. OK, this is, I'm not coming for y'all. <laughs> I promise. A Swap Feeds, for those of you who are not here, I'm looking at some folks in the back, is this rental bike. It's, it's a brilliant model. The average Amsterdam has two to three bikes to one person. And these bikes get stolen all the time, all the time. And so Swap Feeds basically said, let's let you just rent the bike and we'll make the front tire blue so nobody will ever steal a blue tire bike. But why am I saying this? I always find the Swap Feeds is the one that isn't parked properly. The Swap Feeds is the one that is in the middle of the driveway. The Swap Feeds is the one, and I'm just like, do you actually care about your, oh wait, it's not your bike. Um, so this is not a dig at Swap Feeds. It's like liber your liberty, it's great. That's what the product is for. But it's this mentality I'm trying to come to in ownership versus renting. And so if, you know, we used to say something on Netflix, we're not a place where a piece of paper's on the ground and people walk past it. We're not a place where a tap is broken and people don't report that to the company. And that's how I want you to think about this product team. And I hear this all the time, even in my teams, they'll come and say, oh my God, this happened, and they said that, and this said that, and that said that. And then you start to dig in and go through the five whys, and it's like, wait, you realize you're the problem, right? You have to start first with doing all the things I've just talked about and really take on this ownership mentality. And so if you were to think about, you know, uh, 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 if you were to think about a, a, an owner, an owner, and you think about yourself as a startup, and I'm sure there's startups in the room, there's this first piece of like, I actually understand the PL. I understand how I impact the business top line. I understand how, whether I'm a flywheel or a funnel, I understand the OKRs, and there is no such thing as the tech OKRs the design OKRs, the product OKRs. We have the exact same OKRs because we're one company, one team. And so we go into a joint planning process. It's intense. We have our teams in their triads come to us and talk about their products in that way. And you know, we think about the plan almost like we were a business. The other thing we do is hygiene. So 
It's your Comstock, it's your newsletters, it's the basic templates for notes at the end of a meeting. And just making sure that, again, going back into that rhythm, there is, I don't have 17 PMs on my team all using 17 different PRDs, product requirement documents. And then finally, coming back to your P1. So your P0s are the things that you launch with an MVP. But often what hap oftentimes what happens is the P you get the product out, you do the launch email, hurrah, hurrah, and nobody comes back to that next step and what's the thing that's going to move that product to the next level. So these are the practical tips um, for owners, not renters. What happens if you don't do that is you create a culture of renters. You create a culture of it's not me, it's somebody else. You create a culture of it's not my responsibility. Let me forward a 40-person email chain plus someone, and I've done my part, right? And that's the culture of owners, not renters, versus efficiency. If, you, if, it, if it was your business, you would summarize that email because you don't want to waste 40 people's time. Painkillers and vitamins. If I asked you there was, Ken, we're in the Netherlands, if you go to your doctor and you say you have any problem whatsoever, they will give you paracetamol. <laughs> if I asked you, you had the choice of vitamin C or a multivitamin, or you had paracetamol for the rest of your life, that's the only option, you probably would pick paracetamol, because those flus, the colds, the pain, the joints. And so one of the things that we, we, we sort of talk about is this problem backlog versus a project backlog. And very tactically, all that is, it's a joint from the triad list of problems, sometimes quant, sometimes qual, that is groomed on a quarterly basis in stack rank order. What does that do? 2020, uh, last year, 2023, announcement, chat GPT, everyone is scrambling, open AI. I'm like, AI is just a tool. What's the problem we want to solve with it? And it was a much more intelligent conversation to go into that list and look for things where there was manualness, there was, you know, um, we needed to pull lots of data together, we needed to understand uh, uh, language and so on. So the problem backlog is literally a list, it should be no longer than 10. If you have more than 10, you haven't done the work. Of 10 problems, that actually you could take that problem and go solve it, right? And you're building conviction along the way during the quarter. And again, my team goes slash studio problems. And everyone just goes to that document when we go into planning or we go into, we have new resources or we freed up resources, we go back to that document. The second related one is your groomed uh, backlog and the set of goals. And what we try to do is continue start, stop all the time. Your, your backlog will always have critical things that need to be started, things that are super important to continue or things that you need to stop. And so when I think about you know, something new that's coming in, tech debt or a RIF, which we've had, like RIF is reduction, it's a fancy word for reduction in, reduction in force. When I think about those things, we're not reacting because we're able to go in and say, well, here is the, here is the um, impact or trade-off to what you're, this decision you're about to make. And the thing that this allows us to do is create this ability to be nimble and to react either it's to the problem that's coming in or to the backlog or goals that we need to um, uh, uh, focus on. And the final one is understand work. Those two things I just talked about really come down to being able to con continually understand the pain points of customers. And the understand work, it's constant dog fooding, it's constant UXR. We will create our UXR and put it in a Google chat so everybody can join and actually listen in. So there's this, the, the list of problems and your list of goals, everyone constantly understands why team A is doing what they're doing or team C is doing what they're, what they're doing, and you have UX design and product involved in that understand work. If you don't do this, what starts to happen is you're not able to pivot. And when you think about most companies that were not able to reinvent themselves, it's this inability to react. Because, oh, we set a course, we need to finish the thing we launched. Actually, maybe it needs to be a stop. Or maybe there's something that needs to start. And I think if we take that agency a little bit more, for a lot of PMs, we'd be able to solve um, uh, the ability to react to things. Last two tenets, excellence over consensus. Um, Steve Jobs is famed for putting rocks, or saying that you know, he uh, met this old guy who put rocks in a washing machine, 
and the rock sort of tumbled in the washing machine and it came out completely polished. And that's how I think about most discussions. When my team goes in and they're trying to optimize for consensus, I'm like, well, you're trading off excellence. So tell me your polarities. There are three things there practically that you can apply. One is this notion of the product statement. Before we start any product, we create this product statement that talks about who the customer is, and it's one customer, what their problem is specifically, what the solution is, and what the impact it's going to have in the market. And there's a template, I'll send that later through the slides to folks. But by starting the meeting with that product statement, you force everyone to go through their version of the product statement, and you have this way to provoke a response and discuss where you have differences. For example, are we a product or a platform? Studio is a product versus studio is a platform, and that was the debate within the team. The other thing we use is polarity mapping. Instead of going pros versus con, polarity mapping is saying scale versus reach versus depth, for example. And framing problems in that way so that you're actually able to argue both sides. And we force our product teams to come up with this framing for both sides of the coin. You might have a recommendation, but you've done the work of understanding the different polarities. Again, you're provoking a response by creating intentional friction. And then finally is the pre-mortem. We start any project. There's one we're working on right now. One of the pre-mortem things was, I said I was going to talk about Jenny. I'll give another example. But we, <laughs> we talked about one technology versus the other. And the pre-mortem you know, brought up a lot of things around TPUs and a lot of things around you know, the, the, the cost of it. And actually what we found was that was an important detail because it completely changed the course of that project. Finally, this is going to get a little bit personal. A friend of mine called me um, sometime last year. She's half, uh, she's, you know, she, she moved back to, she moved back, she's half uh, Austrian, half Iranian. She moved back to Iran. She wanted to create this art house. She wanted folks to come and, you know, join, like, as, as an art residency. She did all the work, and then you, you all know what, this was in 2020, March of 2020. So she moves back, then COVID happens. Then you had the sanctions, then you had the right, you know, all the things. And I remember her calling me, and just, she, just, she kept saying, I feel like I'm holding my breath for the waves to, to subside. And then we, you know, we kept talking, we kept talking. We also do the, I do the traffic lights with my friends. You send an emoji instead of saying, how are you? You send an emoji of the traffic lights, you get a real response. Is the person red, yellow, or green? And then she came back to me and said something. She said, you know, I just realized Life is like the ocean, and you're always going to have waves. So I need to learn to surf. And so, she's obviously doing very well now, but it hit me really hard, and I wanted to leave you with this message of the surfing analogy of the waves do not stop. Like I said, it's social graphs, buy now, pay later, big data, W3, NFTs, Gen AI, and actually the best product teams hopefully with the tenets I just gave you, are able to have resilience. They don't stand still and fight the change. The wind doesn't try to break them because they're brittle. It's actually you're able to bend and flex with the change. And so at the heart of it is this resilience, is this flexibility, it's adapting, it's adjusting. And it comes down to the humility to realize what you don't know and constantly be learning, the curiosity to always be trying new ways of doing things and being okay with failing, especially in the unknown. And finally, the courage to be willing to fail so that you can learn from that failure. And those are my six tenets. I'm hoping that by the end of this, and if you're able to apply even just some of those things, you'll realize that the magic happens in the confluence of our differences. Thank you.